Hello, everyone. I'm Guy Lancaster, editor of the Online Encyclopedia of Arkansas, which is based in the Bobby L. Roberts Library for Arkansas History and Art. The Roberts Library is located in downtown Little Rock, um, across Rock Street from the main library, and houses the galleries at Library Square and the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies. During the pandemic, the Central Arkansas Library System branches are offering curbside service for patrons to pick up their library materials. And you can use our Ask a Librarian, Ask a Genealogist service to get your research questions answered via phone or email. Last month, several branches uh, began allowing a limited number of patrons into their buildings by appointment to use computers, fax items, and other services. For more details about all these services, go to cals.org, C-A-L-S dot O-R-G. You can even visit us in the Roberts Library by appointment now. The Roberts Library Research Room and the galleries at Library Square will be open on a limited basis Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. and again from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. The 9 to 11 time slot will be set aside exclusively for high-risk populations. During these hours, both the galleries and the research room will take appointments and allow a very, very limited number of walk-up visitors. For more information, go to robertslibrary.org. And of course, we're doing a lot of virtual programming while we're closed, uh, including story times, cooking classes, craft activities, and podcasting. You can find most of these programs archived on Cal's YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com and search for the Central Arkansas Library System. Subscribe to the channel to get notification when the latest videos are posted and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to fill your feed with interesting, fun, and educational content. One of the things we're doing at Roberts Library is collecting your stories, photos, and art relating to the COVID-19 experience of Arkansans. We did a similar collecting initiative last year during the Arkansas River flood. Please go to robertslibrary.org for more information or to submit your photographs and stories. Uh, we do want to hear from you. Your story is important to Arkansas history. Now to this evening's program titled, There is a Great Deal of Sickness in Our Regiment, Disease in Civil War Arkansas by David Sesser. Dr. David Sesser is the collections librarian at Huey Library at Henderson State University in Arkadelphia. An alumnus of Henderson, he holds graduate degrees in public history and higher education from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock and in library and information science from the University of Southern Mississippi. With research focused on both Civil War Arkansas and the history of higher education in the state, he is the author of the 2013 book, The Little Rock Arsenal Crisis on the Precipice of the American Civil War, and the 2015 book, The School with a Heart, Henderson State University at 125. If you have any questions, feel free to add them into the chat on Zoom anytime during this talk, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. This is also being broadcast on YouTube, but please don't leave any questions there. And now I shall turn this over to Dr. David Sasser. Well, thank you, Guy. Thank you, and I'm gonna go ahead and share from beginning. All right. Okay, I'm good to go. I want to uh, thank all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, this is a topic in which I've been interested for several years. It all began um, a few years ago in the history of disease class at uh, UA Little Rock. It's a graduate level course in the public history program that was taught uh, actually on the UAMS campus so we had medical students in there as well which offered a lot in that class and uh, uh, I began my research and wrote a paper about the history of disease in Helena during the Civil War and then I uh, just expanded that and eventually wrote the entry on Civil War disease for the Encyclopedia of Arkansas and so I've just kind of expanded upon that and uh, I hope you find uh, this presentation interesting. So first, why do we need to discuss disease in the Civil War? How did various diseases impact the war itself? Uh, as you can see, 
roughly 700,000 people in the armed forces died during the Civil War. This does not include civilians. And it also really doesn't include uh, guerrillas as well. So these are really just people who were enlisted in either the Army or Navy of the United States or Confederate States. And as you will note, uh, more than two thirds of these injuries were not from combat. Um, they were from disease. Estimates place more than 6 million cases of illness in the Union Army during the Civil War, which means roughly every Union soldier or sailor was sick at least twice during the war. And that is sick enough to be in the hospital, not just sick and stay in camp on limited duty. This is sick enough to be recorded. So with all of these people sick, you can't really fight a war if you're constantly sending people to the hospital. Uh, this presentation, while including some information on the impact of disease on Confederate troops, it mainly focuses on the impact of disease on Union troops in Arkansas. The reason for this is there are simply more resources available on Union troops in Arkansas. Better records exist for Union troops. So disease before the war in Arkansas, um, Arkansans became sick on a regular basis, just like other 19th century Americans. And you can see I have some of the uh, diseases that were prevalent in the area um, listed there. Yellow fever, there was a pretty bad outbreak in 1855 at Helena. Uh, I have this specifically mentioned because we will be talking about Helena a lot in this presentation. Ultimately, this outbreak wasn't that bad. Only about six people died. But the reason so few people died is basically the whole town evacuated from low lying Helena and moved on top of Crowley's Ridge where they could be away. Uh, cholera, one of the earliest recorded outbreaks is uh, in 1832. And it was along both the Arkansas and Mississippi rivers, uh, and uh, quite a few people died uh, as they were moving up and down the river on steamboats. And you can see typhoid. Uh, we think there was an outbreak there in 1769. It's not exactly clear what happened there, but quite a few men who were stationed at the post at Arkansas Post died in that outbreak. And you'll notice that I have measles. Uh, on here as well as a disease. We really don't think of measles in the 21st century as something that would cause huge outbreaks. Well, we used to think that at least. Uh, now with people refusing to take vaccines, we are seeing more and more outbreaks of measles. Measles killed a lot of people in the military during the Civil War, and we'll talk more about that. So early in the war, obviously, Arkansas was a Confederate state. They began uh, organizing to send men into the military. Uh, as a rural state, distance helped keep, dis helped keep diseases at bay. When men from every corner of the state began gathering together in close quarters, diseases began to spread easily. Coupled with an inexperienced with sanitation, small outbreaks could quickly spread among crowded encampments. Think about you have 16, 17, 18 year old men who grew up on farms, all of a sudden they're living together in tent encampments. Um, they don't have their parents to watch out for them. Officers are elected by popular vote. So you don't have people with real military experience in charge at this point of the war. So the people who are most popular, who will let you get away with doing the least amount of work are most likely to be in charge. Uh, they don't know that you need to dig your latrines hundreds of yards away from your water sources, for instance. Basic things like this quickly led to outbreaks of disease. And then also you just have the close quarters where people just don't clean as well as they should. So two examples of this in Arkansas, 
uh, Camp Nelson, which is in northern Lone Oak County near uh, present day Cabot. Uh, about 1500 Confederate soldiers died there from typhoid and measles. And these were main, mainly troops from Texas with some from the Indian Territory in Arkansas. Um, what's notable about this group is a general died from the, the outbreak there, Brigadier General Allison Nelson. Uh, and then we also have Camp White Sulphur Springs, which is located southwest of Pine Bluff. Uh, troops from Texas and the Indian Territory there died from measles in 1862. Uh, we're not sure why, or we're not sure how many died there, uh, but there are quite a few. Um, these troops were kept at that camp in an effort to defend the state after the Battle of Pea Ridge. Um, uh, that's really what changed the the whole dynamic of the war in Arkansas. After the Battle of Pea Ridge, the majority of Confederate forces in the state moved east of the Mississippi River, and uh, the Confederate government in charge of Arkansas desperately grabbed any troops that they could and forced them to stay here to defend against a uh, Union army that was already in the state. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but the lack of preparation um, for these troops at these camps caused these outbreaks, which led ultimately to thousands and thousands of deaths. So I just have a few images. This is the uh, Camp Nelson marker, uh, and you can see the unknown graves behind it. And then uh, Camp White Sulphur Springs as well. And then this is a photograph of Allison Nelson, who, although he was a Brigadier General from Texas, was actually the mayor of Atlanta, Georgia, for about six months. And um, so those are his two claims to fame. He died of disease in Arkansas, and he was a former mayor of Atlanta. So uh, I mentioned Helena earlier. Uh, Helena is very important in the whole military situation of the state during the war. After the Union victory at the Battle of Pea Ridge in March 1862, the Federal Army of the Southwest moved across the northern portion of the state in an effort to take advantage of the evacuation of the majority of Confederate forces in Arkansas to new locations east of the Mississippi. After a long journey, the Army eventually arrived at Helena. The city on the river offered Union forces a strategic port, but it also had its drawbacks. Um, they basically moved from northwest Arkansas, you know, uh, northeast of Bentonville, through southern Missouri, across northern Arkansas. They captured Batesville, for instance. Uh, seeing if they could capture Little Rock, they never really could get organized enough to move down and capture Little Rock. And they needed a supply route, so they just they captured Helena which of course Helena is on the Mississippi River, and they uh, were able to open supply lines that way with Memphis and St. Louis. And you see this quote on the screen at the bottom from uh, A.O. Marshall, the 33rd Illinois. He's discussing the poor condition that the men were in when they arrived in Helena. They, many of them were already sick and exhausted. They were crawling. Um, one company only had 24 men when they arrived, and that's out of a full strength of 101. So that's less than 25% of their men uh, that they started their service with are effective when they arrive at Helena. So life at Helena quickly became difficult for the troops and civilians in the city. Uh, the first group began arriving on July 12th. The Union troops soon began establishing defensive lines, making travel more difficult for civilians in the city. These defensive lines forced people to live more closely together. Thomas C. Heinemann, a Helena resident, served in the Confederate Army, and at the time that Union forces took the city, served as commander of the Confederate Department of the Trans-Mississippi with headquarters in Little Rock. He was a major general in the Confederate Army. 
he was tasked with um, uh, building an army from scratch with few supplies because everything had moved east of the Mississippi. So he stripped the countryside of supplies, including medical supplies. This left the Union troops at Helena in a precarious situation until they could establish regular supply routes with Memphis and other cities on the Mississippi. Now, these problems are compounded by the thousands of escaped slaves that began arriving in the city. Some actually came with the army, and then as word began to spread um, in the Mississippi Delta that the Union troops were there in Helena, thousands and thousands of, uh, of escaped slaves began arriving in the city. General Samuel Curtis refused to return those slaves obviously using the term contraband of war because he felt that if they were returned, they would be used against the Union Army by building fortifications and things like that. So uh, this really crowded the city. And of course it led to the adoption of the famous name, Hell in Arkansas. Uh, and Heinemann lived in Helena before the war, was very active in the community. He took, any medical supplies that he could find from across the state, including Helena, and moved them all to Little Rock and other locations in central and southwestern Arkansas, where they would both be better protected from Union invasion and they would be better able to serve Confederate forces. Now, I have a, a few photos here. Um, this is an image of Union troops at Helena. You can see a line of troops at the bottom. Uh, right in front of some tents. But what's interesting is the White House in the distance behind them, that is the home of Major General uh, T.C. Hyman. And it was actually turned into a hospital right after the Union troops arrived in the city. Now other hospitals were built, but that was the largest and main hospital to begin with. Now these are just two good quotes from men who served at Helena. Uh, disease became an integral part of the daily life of the men holding Helena. Many wrote letters or in their diaries about the diseases killing their comrades. It is also important to remember that many men who became ill at Helena were evacuated from the city to Memphis or St. Louis. So not all deaths from diseases co uh, contracted at Helena were buried there. So that actually lowers the numbers of men from uh, who became ill at Helena and actually died there. Uh, the first quote is where I get the uh, title for this presentation. There's a great deal of sickness in our regiment uh, from Charles Musser from the 29th Iowa. But the second one by A.F. Sperry of the 33rd Iowa is one of my favorite ones. Diarrhea was universal, almost unanimous. That that tells you everything that you need to know right there. Most of these diseases that these men had were intestinal uh, illnesses, which makes you have diarrhea constantly and you eventually die from diarrhea. It is a terrible, terrible way to die. Uh, and other diseases of course were in the area, uh, yellow fever, which also causes vomiting and nausea, malaria, which causes chills and fever, but the two big ones are cholera and typhoid, which are uh, passed through bacterial infections in contaminated water. So uh, we have the Battle of Helena. Of course, these men are only in the city because there's a war going on. That is what makes the situation so terrible, is not only do they have to live in close quarters with all of these refugees coming in, but they also have to prepare for Confederate attack. Uh, during the Battle of Helena, Union forces easily protected the city from the Confederate attack but their defensive efforts were hampered a bit by the number of men sick in the hospital. So right before the Battle of Helena, several thousand men were transferred from Helena to Vicksburg to help federal forces there. 
And as you can see on this slide, Confederate forces attacked on July 4th, 1863, which is the day that the garrison at Vicksburg surrendered. So this is probably one of the most pointless battles of the Civil War because it was designed just to divert federal forces from Vicksburg. Um, and the 33rd Iowa had so many men in the hospital that they got the men who could walk and carry a weapon, organized them and put them on the line to fight. Now they didn't see very much action, but they still showed up even though they were sick. And this is just an image of Fort Curtis, which is the main Union stronghold at Helena. Uh, it fired the first shot of the battle. So once again, Helena is an important linchpin in the um, conduct of the war in Arkansas. Um, the Little Rock expedition, which occurred in the summer after the Battle of Helena was launched from the city. <clears throat> uh, Major General Frederick Steele, who had been at Vicksburg, transferred to Arkansas, and he led an expedition to capture our capital city. But Steele led a sick army from Helena. His men, many of his men, were already sick before they left. Uh, moving through eastern Arkansas, thousands of men fell ill due to poor water and mosquito-borne diseases. They moved over to the White River and they captured Clarendon and later Duvall's Bluff. And that thankfully allowed uh, Union transports to go up the White River, pick up sick men and take them back down the White and up the Mississippi to Memphis and St. Louis and places like that. Uh, after just two weeks in the field, uh, Steele had lost half of his army as combat effectives. That means that they could not perform their duties. Now, most of those were due to sickness, but of course, some of those were guarding the sick, guarding the supply lines to get medical supplies to those sick men. And you can see I have two examples of um, our artillery batteries from Ohio. The uh, fifth Ohio battery lost 14 men just marching from Helena to Little Rock. That's, they didn't lose any men in battle. And a company of the 126 Illinois had to take over uh, at least one gun of the 11th Ohio battery because all the men on that gun were sick. I'm not sure how many of those men died, but uh, the this infantry regiment had to do double duty. So it was very difficult for Steele to make good progress. But he was ultimately successful. And this is an image of the third Minnesota in front of uh, the old state house in Little Rock. The third Minnesota was the first Union unit in that actually went into the city of Little Rock. Now, this is a great photo. This is the one that accompanied the uh, uh, announcement for this presentation. This is a Union hospital in Little Rock. Um, the brick building you see in the background on the right is actually St. John's Masonic College. And you can see how large this hospital is. There are at least eight or 10 barracks that you can see in this image alone. And each one of them is fairly large. Uh, now, this is located just to the east of the MacArthur Museum of Arkansas Military History. It's roughly under what is now Interstate 30 in Little Rock. So medical care for Union troops in the war uh, was on both the regimental level and in larger general hospitals. Each regiment was uh, assigned a surgeon and at least one assistant surgeon, sometimes some medical orderlies, things like that. Uh, but when men are enlisting early in the war and they are recruiting doctors, they're not thinking about, uh, we're gonna have to treat 
sickness, we're going to need to treat battle wounds, you know, saber cuts, gunshots, things like that. Uh, a lot of these early war doctors were not trained and did not know how to effectively take care of sick men. Eventually, some standards were put into place. They were able to weed out most of the ill-trained doctors and replace them. And then you have the uh, general hospitals um, located in Little Rock, Duval's Bluff, and Helena. USCT units began to serve in Arkansas in 1863. They had problems attracting doctors to serve with them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But also they dealt with problems of segregation. Um, you can see that there were two USCT hospitals in Arkansas, Little Rock and Duvall's Bluff. The city that's missing from that is Helena which is where a lot of USCT troops served. So if they became ill, they'd have to put them on a boat, send them down the Mississippi and up the White to Duvall's Bluff or send them to Memphis. They would most likely send them to Duvall's Bluff to keep them in Arkansas. Uh, it's, it's just interesting and a bit sad that they didn't build a hospital for these troops at Helena. So life in camp specifically in Helena, uh, as those thousands of slaves began escaping in 1863, 1863, there are estimates that 25% of the slaves who arrived in Helena died from disease. Uh, the federal government was struggling to feed the slaves as well as supply their own troops in the field. And they could not provide them with anything other than basic rations most of the time. Even some of the time they couldn't provide that. So medical care was out of the question. Uh, you have to remember Helena is at the end of a very long supply line at this point of the war. Uh, in 1862 through half of 1863, the Mississippi River is not open. So everything has to come down the river from the north, and it just takes a long time to get equipment to the city, especially when uh, troops in St. Louis and Memphis and these other cities also need equipment and supplies. Um, so even though the slaves who had escaped and were living in the city and the white troops lived separately, when you have so many people in such a tight area, you can't help but have contamination. And uh, the slaves were given diseases to the white troops in the same way the white troops were given diseases to the slaves and epidemics just continually swept the city. Eventually, uh, federal officers began setting up uh, plantations where the slaves would be moved and they could live on their own, grow their own crops, and then also grow some cash crops. And that helped lower the uh, number of uh, freed slaves in the city. But that took until after the Battle of Helena for that really to take off. And we don't see su substantially lower numbers of slaves in the city or, or former slaves until 1864, 1865. I just wanted to put this photo in there. Um, this is in the Library of Congress. And this is all of the information I have. Miss S.J. Edwards, who was a nurse in Little Rock during the war, and it's dated 1864-1865. So the impact of disease, we do have some, some solid numbers of um, troops who became ill in Arkansas during the Civil War, at least for the Union side. You can see over 182,000 white troops in the state became ill during the war. Uh, 44, 57 were directly related to wounds or accidents. So that's combat or accidents because accidents were always happening. So the remainder, 178,000 became ill due to disease. Of those, 2,300 died in the state from illness during the war. Uh, and of course, this does not include troops who were transferred elsewhere. 
the most prevalent disease was malaria. And this, this is staggering. Every Union soldier in the state suffered from malaria on an annual basis, statistically. So if you were stationed in Arkansas as a Union soldier, you're pretty much guaranteed to catch malaria, unless you died of something else first. So uh, the mortality rate uh, on the USCT troops in the state, uh, you can see that it was 148 per 1,000 compared with 88 per 1,000 for white troops. Overall, and this is including uh, Arkansas and other states, about 37% of all African-American troops died during the war. And this is, this is particularly concerning because these troops saw much less combat statistically than their white counterparts. Most USCT units spent the majority of their service uh, building fortifications, manning fortifications, doing things like that behind the main lines. Now, many of them did see a lot of combat, but as a whole, their combat rate was much lower. Plus, they were organized much later in the war. Uh, overall, white and black soldiers became ill at about the same rate, but USCT troops died from the disease uh, at a much, much higher rate than their white troop, uh, than their white counterparts, more than five times. A sheer lack of surgeons and other trained medical personnel led to these higher rate of disease and death in USCT units especially as many USCT units served their entire careers without ever receiving a surgeon assigned to their ranks. Surgeons and assistant surgeons assigned to USCT units were ineligible to serve in staff positions. So by the time USCT units were organized, the number of trained medical professionals who desired to serve in the military was severely depleted and a lack of opportunity for advancement led many to turn down a position with a black regiment. So they, dis, they did not have the same quality of care as their white counterparts did in the Union Army. Now I did wanna add a little bit more information about Confederates in Arkansas. Um, so uh, the Confederate government did organize a medical exam review board in Little Rock um, they set up tests for physicians and they would give them written and oral tests to see if they were qualified to serve as surgeons. Um, a med medicine manufacturing facility was constructed here in Arkadelphia. It operated for maybe two, two and a half years and it was uh, disassembled and most of the materials were moved to Texas after the fall of Little Rock. Uh, but of course, we don't have reliable numbers on the number of Confederates who suffered from disease in the state, nor do we really know how many died in the state uh, during the war. We do know in 1864, 1865, uh, in southwest Arkansas, where the bulk of the Confederate Army was stationed at that time, uh, there were epidemics still going through camps, and men were still dying at that late part of the war. So uh, these. Last slides, I'm just gonna click through them uh, so you can maybe go back later on YouTube and look at these sources. These are all good sources, uh, a lot of primary sources about life in Arkansas during the war and uh, just uh, things if you wanna do more research and learn more about uh, disease in Civil War Arkansas. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, we have a few questions. Uh, one is, did they have medical staff? And I assume that's asking, did like each regiment have its own medical staff? Yes. Uh, so they uh, each had at least one surgeon who had some training, and then they had assistant surgeons who typically had less training, but at least some medical school training. 
uh, in addition to that, usually men were pulled out of individual companies to serve as medical orderlies. So they were doing the day-to-day -day nursing of their, their comrades. Uh, also, if a regiment had a band, those men would typically serve as medical orderlies when they weren't performing as well. So each, uh, each white unit, at least theoretically, had medical personnel. And of course, a lot of the USCT units struggled to, to have uh, any support. So the, I don't know what that was. Did uh, USCT regiments, did, uh, were, were black soldiers uh, not recruited as medical orderlies? Uh, typically they, that would fall to the uh, regimental surgeon to pick men and, and have them with, you know, some basic training. If they didn't have a, a regimental surgeon, they didn't really have anyone to fill that role. Okay. So yeah, it, it, it all started at that, that top level. And since they didn't have anyone there, it just kind of fell apart a, a lot of the time. Um, someone asked, what about female nurses? Uh, female nurses were definitely um, present, uh, mostly in the general hospitals. So the Confederacy also had some general hospitals, most notably in Atlanta and uh, Richmond. Um, they, the female nurses played a very, very important role in helping the men once they made it to those general hospitals. Uh, but in the field and in these smaller cities and encampments, it was typically men taking care of men. Um, not always, not always, but um, the, the nurses really came into play in these, these bigger hospitals. Okay. Um, you had a figure of 182,000 some white union troops becoming ill in, during the war. Do you know how many, uh, out of a total, how many troops that is? Like how many troops were, you, uh, white union troops were operating in Arkansas during the war? Oh, uh, in Arkansas, that's a good question. I realize some of the, you know, they're coming into the state, leaving the state. It's yes. Our... Yeah, it's, it's, to say it fluctuates is putting it lightly. Um, I would say at the high point of union forces in the state, uh, we never had more than 20 to 25,000 union troops in Arkansas at once. And that there are three main uh, cities where they would have been, Little Rock, Helena, and Fort Smith. The reason we don't talk a lot about Fort Smith is it was actually under the control of the Department of Kansas for most of the war. And so when people would get sick there, they would send them to Fort Scott, Kansas. And it's, it's just more difficult to determine what they were actually doing. And even, even if they were at Fort Smith, they're probably actually in the Indian Territory. Um, so they, uh, I would, yeah, I would say 20 to 25,000 Arkansas, while it was important, I, I, the civil war in Arkansas was very important. We were not the main focus of either army. So someone asked what sort of epidemic control was used? So, um, the, similar to what they did before the war in Helena for, let's say, mosquito-borne diseases, yellow fever in particular, um, before the war, people moved to Crowley's Ridge during the summer. I mean, if you were rich, and, and you know, there was a chance that you were rich if you were living in Helena, uh, and you were white, of course, you would move to Crowley's Ridge. You would have a second house up there. And you would stay there from probably May until the first frost. And then you would come home and, and live in your big plantation house. Um, Union troops really couldn't do that because they were forced to stay in that city and they couldn't 
really escape it in the summer. And that there are some great accounts about how terrible it was and how hot and just nasty and how it smelled and things like that. So they, they really couldn't escape the mosquitoes. Now with uh, waterborne diseases, as the war progressed, they began isolating people as they began uh, as they became sick they could try to determine where they became sick you know from what water source were they drinking um but once again the problem with helena is it is very low lying right next to the river whenever the mississippi river floods river water uh, will go into cisterns which people use for water storage and you drink that water and you're sick so there were just things that they could try to do. They could try to limit exposure, but since they're in the middle of a war zone, there was not very much that they could do overall. Okay. That seems to be it for the questions uh, we have on the Zoom chat. Let me just make sure. Yeah, that looks like it. So if no one else has uh, anything more, David, we really appreciate this. Yeah, no problem. Uh, and, and if you think of a question later, you can find my information at, on the Henderson State University website. Just shoot me an email. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and with that, we'll wrap things up. Join us two weeks from today, where we will be talking with William Lindsay, who will be discussing soundings in medical history, hazards of U.S. medical practice in the past. And this is a talk taken from his new book published by University of Arkansas Press. So again, we really appreciate it. Very timely stuff. Uh, right now we're currently talking a whole lot about the Civil War and about pandemic. So this is just hits both of those. <laughs> so we really appreciate it. Thank you everyone for tuning in and we hope to see you in two weeks.